In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you very much for our gathering together unto you. We thank you because you prepared the table before us and you want to feed us with this heavenly manner. We pray that every one of us will receive from your hand and from your spirit in Jesus' name. We pray, O Lord, that as you prepare us for the glory to come, none of us will miss heaven in Jesus' name. We know there are multitudes out there in the world that are not prepared for heaven. And when they miss heaven, they will cry. But we pray, O Lord, our Lord will not be like theirs in Jesus' name. Whatever it takes for us to be ready, do it for every one of us in Jesus' name. Prepare your people. We pray that you teach us your word today. And what we learn today will be a part of what prepares us, what prepares us for the glory to come in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. In our study of the scriptures, we now come to James chapter 5, the last chapter of James. We are studying today from verse 1 to verse 6. James 5, from verse 1. Please open your Bible as we read together. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your misery that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth eaten. Your gold and silver is conquered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were by it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, cries, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth, and have been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and it does not resist you. You'll find that in that place we are studying about the wicked men who are wealthy. And you have a combination of two things, wealth and wickedness. And when those two things combine together, it's something that is condemned of God. In these verses that we're going to look at today, James shows us the present anguish in the present world of today and the future agony, the judgment to come of men and women who seek and use wealth in wicked ways. Of course, we need to understand from the beginning that there is nothing wrong in possessing wealth. If we seek that wealth and use that wealth in righteous ways, if you're a student of the Bible, you will understand that Abraham was rich. And you think about Isaac or Job or Joseph or Pharimathea in the New Testament and many others in the, in the Bible. They were rich. In fact, the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, it tells us the very source of wealth. And if we're children of God, how we become successful or prosperous or wealthy. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, it says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth. He giveth thee the power to get wealth. If uh, wealth or riches was sinful by itself, then the Lord will not give the power to possess what is sinful. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. Proverbs 10, verse 22. We are told that being wealthy, if you find it in the way of righteousness, is a blessing of the Lord. It says, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. And the same thing you'll find when you come to the New Testament. The New Testament does not condemn wealth outrightly. If you seek that wealth, and you get that wealth in the way of the Lord, and you spend whatever you have to the glory of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, not trust in uncertain riches, 
but in the living God who giveth, that's what we need to look at, he giveth us richly all things to enjoy. As we come to the uh, epistle we're looking at, that is the epistle of James, and you're looking at verses 1 through to 6, and you see the condemnation that it brings upon the people that are wealthy and they were wicked, you'll understand, it's not a condemnation of wealth, it's a condemnation of using wealth in the wrong way. That's why we learn from the Bible that those who brought wrath upon themselves and they got into judgment and premature death, they were the people that used their wealth or they desired wealth and prosperity in simple, wicked ways. Some names come to mind, like Achan like Jezebel, like Solomon, like Jesus Iscariot, Ananias, and Sapphira. All these people lost their lives. Indeed, they lost their souls in the pursuit and possession of wealth with wickedness. Those who oppress others, who cheat others, who steal, who gamble, who bribe, who sacrifice to idols, or ladies that might have to yield themselves to immorality, Others who sin and backslide in order to get or increase wealth, they do that at the peril of their souls, the jeopardy of their eternal destiny. So have it in mind, understand. Now, any time you have the combination of wickedness and wealth, wealth and wickedness, it's always a dangerous thing. We're looking at three points as we look at our study today. Number one, the denunciation of wicked, wealthy men. The denunciation, condemnation of wicked, wealthy men. Number two, the destitution of wicked, wealthy men. The destitution of wicked, wealthy men. And then number three is the damnation of wicked, wealthy men. We're bringing those two things together, not just wealthy men, but wicked as well as they are wealthy as well as wicked. We come to number one, the denunciation of wicked, wealthy men. We look at James chapter 5 verse 1. Go to now, you rich men, weep and howl for your mysteries that shall come upon you. I told you last week that those three words that begin begin the chapter, go to now, you find it was peculiar with James. No other writer in the New Testament uh, uses uh, those words in that combination. You find it in uh, chapter 4, verse 13. Go to now, ye that say. Whenever James wanted to express something shocking, something surprising, something he wanted them to awake and listen to and pay attention very well, he will use that expression, go to now. It's like saying, stop there. It's like saying, think about it. It's like saying, awake. It's like saying, behold, look at what I'm telling you. And then it says, go to now, awake and listen, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Now, if you look at that verse very quick, uh, very thoroughly, you will see that it is contrary to the way rich men think. Rich men do not think of weeping. They do not think of wailing or screaming or howling. And he says that's exactly what he was calling them to. Weep and howl, scream and wail because of something that will come upon you. And then it says, for your mysteries that shall come. Now you know the rich people, they never think of suffering. They never think of misery. They never think of anything negative. They feel that wealth will buy everything. But he said, you are dead wrong. That's why I was calling them and he was saying, you must weep and you must howl because of the suffering, the shame, the agony, and because of the mysteries that shall come upon you. The whole Bible actually denounces wealthy, wicked people who oppress the poor to become rich. The Bible denounces the people that will oppress other people, afflict other people, cheat other people, destroy the lives of other people so they can have their ways and so they can be rich. And so it is not an isolated text we're looking at today as we look at James. In fact, it's a direct condemnation he gives to these unrighteous men who are rich because of the detestable corruption in their lives. You will see how James was very particular. Look at those verses again from verse 1 to verse 6 and see the personification and see the direct way in which he addressed the rich people. He said in verse 1, ye rich men. 
And then he says that the mystery shall come upon you. And in verse 2 he says, your riches are corrupted. He was direct at them and he said, it's your riches that will be corrupt. And then he says, your garments are moth eaten. In verse 3, your gold and your silver is conquered. And then he tells us that uh, there will be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire and then it goes on you he said you have reaped treasure heaped up treasure together for the last days and then he talks to them and as he goes on to verse 6 ye have condemned and killed the just and he does not resist you you see the way he uses the word you or your and you will know that it was very, very direct. It was so direct that all the wicked, uh, wealthy men in the congregation in which the epistle was read, there was no way they could miss the message of the warning of God unto them. Other parts of the Bible also confirm the same thing. Warning wicked people who amass wealth by wickedness. Let's turn to the Bible in Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3. Reading from verse 11. It says, Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his sins shall be given him. And then in verse 14, he tells us the Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people and the princes thereof. For ye have eaten up the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your houses. You will see what the Lord is doing here. He's defending the right of the poor. But the rich people were oppressing the poor. And it says, because I love the poor, I defend the poor, and their interest is my interest, I delight in them because they believe in me. And because you are oppressing them, I am against you, he said. And in verse 15, he said, what mean ye? That ye should beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor, says the Lord God of hosts. Isaiah continues telling us that God is not happy with the wicked people that are enriching themselves by oppressing the poor people of the land. In Isaiah chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees, that tried grievousness, which they have prescribed to turn aside the needy from judgment. You see, the reason why war came upon them, why judgment came upon them, why the wrath of God was upon them, it was because they were turning aside the needy from judgment. And then to take away the right from the poor of my people, that the widows may be their prey, and that they may rob the fatherless. You will see the clear testimony and uniform testimony of Scripture that as uh, James talked about it, Isaiah spoke about it as well, that God was against and still against the people that enriched themselves by oppressing the poor. And therefore there was a sharp rebuke for them. In fact, Amos was very direct. Amos was very clear about this matter. In Amos chapter 4, Amos chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says here this word, Ye kind of vision that are in the mountain of Samaria, which oppress the poor. As we're reading all these things, be thinking about yourself. Are you an employer? Are you uh, oppressing the poor? Are you somebody that is uh, having maybe a particular business and you have other people working with you and you're oppressing the poor? Whichever uh, category you fall into, think about the way you are dealing with the people that are less fortunate than you are in life. It says, which oppress the poor, which crush the needy, which say to their masters, bring and let us drink. And then it goes on in uh, verse uh, 2 there. It says, the Lord God as one by his holiness that lo the days shall come upon you that he will take you away with hooks and your posterity with fish hooks and the judgment even came upon them not only upon them even upon their posterity that means upon their children the wicked people who think that they will enrich themselves so that they'll be able to provide something for their children those children will not be able to enjoy the reward of wickedness the only thing the lord is requiring from us is that we will repent so that we will not be oppressing we will not be afflicting the innocent people or the poor people around us in uh, amos chapter 5 Amos chapter 5, verse 10. They hate him that rebuketh in the gate. They, ab they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. 
It's still talking about the wicked rich people. If anybody will come to preach to them or to correct them or to show them that this is not the way, don't enrich yourself by uh, making other people poor. They hate that. They reject that. They hate him that rebuketh in the gate. In verse 11, for as much therefore as your treading is upon the poor, you are trampling upon the poor, and ye take from him the burdens of wheat, that is the wheat, the grains, the food he ought to eat, those bags you take away from him, and ye have built houses of hewn stone, but ye shall not dwell there in there. In them ye have planted pleasant vineyards, but ye shall not drink wine of them. It was talking of the judgment of God upon them. That although you are amassing wealth, and although you are trying to accumulate things, you will not live to enjoy them. Because of your wickedness, for I know in verse 12, your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins, they afflict the just, they take a bribe, they turn aside the poor in the gate from their right. As you examine that verse, does that describe you? It causes mighty sins. It calls it great sins. It says that these are terrible sins indeed when you afflict the just. When you take a bribe so that you'll be able to enrich yourself and uh, even the people that are looking for job, they don't have anything, you'll see take away from them. And it says they turn aside the poor in the gate from their right. In verse 13, therefore, the prudent shall keep silence in that time. For it's an evil time. What, what's an evil time? When there is oppression. When you are turning away the poor from their right. When there is no justice in any place. And when it appears the poor has to be, become poorer. So that we can enrich the rich people. It's an evil time. See good and not evil. Ye that, uh, that she may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as ye have spoken. Hate the evil and love the good. Establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. He was pointing out the way of repentance. That if the rich people, if they want the blessings of the Lord, if they do not want the judgment of God to come upon them, there must be repentance. Amos chapter 8, reading from verse 4. Amos chapter 8, verse 4. Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath, that we may set a fourth wheat, making the ephah small, and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit? It's talking about the people that are selling. And then you make uh, the measure very small, and you get a lot of money from that small measure. You falsify the balances of the weights that you are using, so that you can deceive people and get money from them unjustly. It says, it continues this, their language, that we may buy the poor for silver, and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. That is the things that were not good, that were worthless, they will sell unto the people. The Lord has sworn by, his excellency, by the excellency of Jacob. Surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall not the land tremble for this? And everyone mourn uh, that, uh, that, that dwelleth therein, and it shall rise up holy as a flood, and it shall be cast out and drowned. As by the flood of Egypt. It shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day, and I will turn your fields into mourning, and uh, all your songs into lamentation, and I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and uh, boldness upon every head, and I will make it as mourning for an only son, and the end thereof as a bitter day. You will see that uh, the judgment will be so fierce, and the judgment will be so intense, that there will be mourning instead of rejoicing or dancing. And as we look at uh, the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, it's very surprising and very shocking. That anyone that professes to know the Lord and to be worshipping the Lord will be associated with any of this kind of wickedness and will have this denunciation upon him. 
We shouldn't be talking about something like that. In the midst of the children of God, we should know how to help other people, give to other people, make life easier for other people, alleviate their suffering with our riches and our wealth, rather than oppressing other people so that we can have what belongs to them uh, in an unlawful manner. And such a situation, such a spiritual condition shows that such people are depraved. It means they are not born again. It means that they do not have the real life of the Christian. Of course, it may be that they associate with the church outwardly. And yet their wicked hearts will make them uh, not feel inconvenient at all in the midst of corruption, in the midst of fraud, in the midst of oppression in the world. If you are a true believer, you will resent, you will resist the corruption and the selfishness that characterize the rich, fraudulent people of the world. In Micah chapter 2, Micah chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3, Micah chapter 2, woe to them that devise iniquity and walk evil upon their beds when the morning is light, they practice it. Because it's in the power of their hands. It says that these people, it's in the night, they strategize. While they ought to be sleeping on their bed, they'll be strategizing. I'll take that, I'll catch that, I'll get that one again, I'll build up that one. And they'll be planning how they are going to cheat uh, the people uh, that do not know that anybody is scheming for them in verse 2. It says they covet fields and take them by violence. And they covet houses and they take them away. So they oppress a man and his house, even a man and his heritage. Therefore, because of those things they have done, thus says the Lord, behold, against this family do I devise an evil, from which ye shall not remove your necks, neither shall ye go haughtily, for this time is evil. It's a timely warning for the people that are doing evil. A timely warning for the people that are oppressing the poor. Jesus Christ said the same thing concerning the people that are rich unlawfully or they have unlawful gain to oppress other people. They oppress other people so they can have uh, what they want. It says there will be weeping, there will be lamentation, there will be wrong, there will be judgment coming upon them even on the final day. Luke chapter 6 these are the very words of Jesus Christ, Luke chapter 6, from verse 24, But woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. And so we find uniformly in the scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament, that the people that enrich themselves by oppressing other people, cheating other people, giving bribes or committing sin, so that they can have the riches and the wealth of the world, they have the judgment of God upon them. That's why James said in James chapter 5 verse 1 now, James chapter 5 verse 1, go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl. For your mysteries that shall come upon you. James was warning the wicked, wealthy people of impending doom, impending judgment. He therefore called upon them. He said, weep and how. They were, to, they were called upon to weep. That the original word used there, weep and howl, means to weep out loud, to sob out loud, to cry, to wail, to lament, to shriek, to scream. And sooner or later, every wicked, uh, wealthy person will weep and howl. He may weep and howl in repentance today. And then his sins will be forgiven. And things will totally change. If he doesn't weep today, he'll weep later in eternal regret. And then James tells us why they ought to weep. If they're still living in sin. If they're oppressing the poor. So they can enrich themselves. It says, because your mysteries shall come upon you, rich men and women then who have brought suffering on other people while on earth, they too, they will face their own suffering in eternity. They are condemned because their wealth was fraudulently acquired and then self-indulgently spent and unrighteously misused to oppress other people. Then we go to point number two, the destitution of wicked, wealthy men. The destitution of wicked, wealthy men. We're now in James chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eating. 
your gold and silver is conquered. And the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Now, uh, first of all, he tells us uh, what the wealth of the riches consisted of. As you look at this, you'll see that the riches consisted of three things. Number one, the grains. That is the crop. That is, uh, you know, something like to us, the corn. That's why, because many of them were agricultural people at that time. That's why it says, your riches are corrupted. And then your garments are most eaten. In those days, they measured uh, their wealth by their garments. If you go back to the Old Testament, we don't have enough time to read everything. You remember Joseph, when he wanted to show uh, Jacob back at home that now the Lord had promoted him, he was very rich. What did he do? He gave changes of garments unto those his brothers so they can go and show the father back at home. And then when uh, Naaman was coming to the prophet, how, what did he bring? The riches he brought, they were the garments. That's one of the things that uh, Gehazi took that made him a leper. And when Achan was seeking after uh, the riches, remember the, the contents of the riches, the richly Babylonian garment as well as a wedge of gold. That's how they measured wealth in those days. But then he said, all these rich people, number one, your riches, your crops, your grains, they are corrupted. And then number two, your garments are moth eating. And then they had, they had their money in gold and silver. That's why Jesus said, show me a coin. And he showed him. And those coins, some of them were made of gold and some of them were made of silver. And he said, your riches, whether it is the grain or the garment or the gold, they are conquered, they are corrupted. And it says the rust of them will be a witness against you. That while you are still alive, uh, the garment is moth eaten and the graves are corrupted, and the gold that should not uh, be co corroded or that should not rust is uh, rusting already. It will be a witness against you that these things do not last. Earthly riches, like all earthly things, do not last. Those who possess earthly riches, but who are not treated towards God, will soon come to destitution. They'll come to poverty, they'll come to penury. And if eventually when you die, you will go before the Lord, and there's nothing you are going to bring in the sight of the Lord, because you'll not carry the money away, you'll not carry the garments away, you'll not carry anything away. You came into this world empty, and empty and naked will you go back. It's only the salvation we have, the holiness we have, the faith we have in God, we're going to take up on high to be with the Lord. The wealth of people in Bible days, as I've told you now, consisted of crops, grain, garment, gold, and silver. The rich often stored away those things uh, so that uh, they, maybe they bury them, so as to preserve them. But James was pointing out that all those things were getting away from them, getting corrupted or moth eating or rotting, and those things were becoming useless, and the rest of it will be a proof that those things actually are worthless. But as you look at other parts of the Bible, you find that these people that are amassing wealth, and they are not thinking about God, they are the, pe they are the ungodly people. And because they are ungodly people, judgment will be upon them in Psalm 52. Psalm 52. We're reading verses 5 to 7, but I'm going to read verse 5, for, verse 7 first. Psalm 52, verse 7 first. Lo, this is the man that maketh not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches, and strengthened himself in his wickedness. It says, what we're going to read from verse 5 now. This is applicable to the man that doesn't make God a strength. He doesn't depend upon God. He's not trusting in God. He's living independent of God. He trusts in the abundance of his riches. He strengthened himself in his wickedness. What's going to happen to such a man? From verse 5. God shall likewise destroy thee. That's the one that doesn't have God in his thought, in his life, in his plan. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. In verse 6, the righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him. At present now, the rich people are laughing at the poor people. They think we don't have anything, but if you have Jesus, you have everything in Jesus' name. 
But then at last we'll laugh at them. In Job chapter 20. Job chapter 20 from verse 27. The heaven shall reveal its iniquity. And the earth shall rise up against him. Who is that? The increase of his house shall depart. And his goods shall flow away in the day of his wrath. Who are those people that the Lord is speaking about? In such a, in such a description like this, in verse 29, this is the portion of a wicked man from God. That is, the portion of a wicked man, the portion that will come from God, and the heritage appointed unto him by God. Are you a rich man? Are you a rich woman? With your riches and wealth, are you seeking God? Are you depending upon God? Or are you only depending upon those things that will not last? Proverbs tells us what happens to those riches eventually. If you don't have God and you're seeking after riches and you're running after everything, I must get this, I must increase this, I must buy that land, I must build that house. And you do not have time for the salvation of your soul. Look at the result in Proverbs chapter 23. Verse 5, Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings, they fly away as an eagle toward heaven. How many people have we known? How many people have you come across that will say, times have changed? And they even tell us that uh, the same time does not continue forever. And they will tell you that they were in millions before. But today now, they're living from hand to mouth. They didn't trust in God. And when those riches were there, they were not grateful to God. They didn't know it was God that gave them strength to get the wealth. They relied upon those things. But now, everything is gone away. That's why it says, for riches certainly, surely, without any doubt, make themselves wings and they fly away as an eagle towards heaven. That's why it says, you will not set your heart upon them. You must not set your heart upon them. You trust in the Lord. You set your heart upon the Lord. Then if you have any riches, if you have any wealth, that wealth or the riches you have, you will be able to enjoy because the Lord will preserve them for you because you are a child of God. In Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 11. Jeremiah 17, 11 tells us, As the partridge sitteth on eggs, and hatches them not. So, he that getteth riches, and not by right. He that getteth riches, and not by righteousness. He that gets riches, but not in the right way. It says, he, he shall leave them in the midst of his days, and at the end he shall be a fool. At the end, when he doesn't leave his full day, and then he's taken away from it, he's not able to enjoy the thing he has amassed. Then he will be a fool eventually. He, not only that, he will lose in the physical sense, he will lose also in the spiritual sense, because he'll not be able to get to heaven. And the Bible says, what shall it profit a man? If he gains the whole world, and he loses his own soul. If you are amassing wealth, and because of running after riches, and running after wealth, you will not remember God. You will not seek after the Lord. What's the gain in Mark chapter 10? Mark chapter 10. And it is very serious as we look at these words we are reading. And we recognize they were the words of Jesus Christ. If it were an ordinary man that said it, we will say maybe he didn't know what he was talking about. He should have qualified uh, what he was saying. But here are the words of Jesus. Mark chapter 10 verse 24. And the disciples were astonished at his word. But Jesus answered again and says unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Hard, very difficult it is to enter into the kingdom of God. You know that the preachers today who are making it easy... And they are calling the rich men to come. And they will not tell them about repentance. They will not tell them about restitution. They say, if we talk about that, it will drive them away. We want them to be in the church, in our church. They may be in our church. How are they going to get to heaven? In fact, it says in verse 25, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. The Lord is just demonstrating, illustrating how hard it is. You know how literally impossible it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. 
Now, the eye of a needle, it's a proverbial used for a small gate at that time. And it was a small gate, if you are going to enter Jerusalem, they called it the eye of a needle. And if a camel was going to enter, you will have to offload, take all the load away, and then the camel will bend down and crawl and be able to get in. And uh, Jesus was saying, if the rich men are not able to humble themselves, they are not going to be able to enter in. If they are not going to offload all the fraud, all the booties they have stolen, if they are not going to make restitution and remove all that load and bend down humility and enter into the kingdom, they will not be able to enter. Are you there today? Maybe you are not very rich, but even the little you have, you got them in fraudulent ways. How then do you hope to make heaven at last? Or maybe you have not got it, but you are running after it. Because of it, you will not study your Bible, you will not pray, you will not seek the Lord, you will not fellowship with the people of God. Uh, Sunday, you are in a place of work. Sunday, Saturday night, you are there. Every time you are there, man must eat. I must make something in this life. I don't care whether salvation is gone or sanctification is not there. I must make something by all means. Listen to the word of God in First Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, reading there from verse, uh, from verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. The people that say, I must make it this year. I must become a millionaire. Others have done it, I must do it. Whatever it will take, I, if I need to sink my whole life into it, whatever I will lose, I don't mind. I can't be a worker now. I can't be talking about church now. Let religion go aside now. I must be rich by all means. They that will be rich fall into temptation and into a snare and into many foolish and hurtful laws which draw men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root of all evil. You see, if you love money so much and you are running out and you want it at all costs, you will do evil things because the thing will cover your eyes. You will say, I will repent later. I want to get it now. I will come back to church later. I know it is not right, but when I finish my program, my project, and I get everything, then if I need to, in fact, I'll bring a percentage of it to the church. The love of money is the root of all evil, which while some cover vetted after. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You are not piercing other people. You are piercing yourself. You are destroying yourself. In Second Peter, Second Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 15. Here we are told the life of a covetous man. He was religious before. In fact, he was a prophet of God before. But eventually, because of money, he couldn't take his stand. And running after money, eventually he became a false prophet. And eventually, he died a sinner's death. And now, right now, as we are talking, he's in hellfire. In Second Peter chapter 2, verse 15. Which have forsaken the right way. And are gone away, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozom, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Are you there? Do you love the wages of unrighteousness? You know in your conscience, your conscience is telling you, you are a Christian, that cannot be right. You cannot be doing this. This kind of work is destroying the lives of other people. You say, I don't care for that now. If somebody is thinking about holiness and righteousness, he will not get make ends meet in this life. But you see, we're told about uh, this uh, Balaam. He loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass, speaking with man's voice, forbid, uh, forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water. Clouds that are carried with a tempest. And then to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. I pray the Lord will deliver every one of us in Jesus' name. That such a thing will not be your Lord. That such a thing will not be uh, your possession in Jesus' name. Now, if you come back to James chapter 5, you will see that James was rebuking these wicked rich people for two things. Number one, for their wickedness. Number two, for their foolishness. On the one hand, their wickedness. It said in uh, verse uh, 3 there, it says, your gold and your silver is conquered. And the rust of them shall be a witness against you. Ye have, in the last part, ye have heaped up treasure together. He said, isn't that wicked? There are many poor people around you, many hungry people around you, many jobless people around you, and you are heaping it up. 
and you are holding it and you are storing it up. And while you are storing it up, the people are dying of hunger around you. He said, that is wickedness. And if any of us, if we're doing like that today, that is wickedness on our part. But then he also tells us it's also foolishness because it says in the latter part of that verse 3, it says, it is for the last days. How foolish that when their time on earth was almost gone, they kept the riches that will soon be useless to them in the grave. That's why they were sharply rebuked for, for storing them up without regard for God's timetable. They were about to leave this world, and yet all the things were there. They were not making use of them. If you're a Christian, and you say that you are born again, you have the riches there, you have everything. You are not spending them. You are just keeping them in a bank account. There is secret bank bank account, there's another bank account over there, and people are perishing around you. When Jesus comes, and the saints are taking away all the money you are keeping, you are not even using for your children, you are not using for members of your family, you are not using for neighbors around that need your help, everything will fall into the hands of the Antichrist, and then will you be an eternally foolish man, eternally foolish woman. I pray God will teach us wisdom to make use of whatever God has given us before the end of our lives in Jesus' name. And then, when you have used it in the way of the Lord, when you get to heaven, there will be great reward for every, everybody. We come now to point number three, and it's the damnation of wicked, wealthy men. The damnation of wicked, wealthy men. In James chapter 5, James chapter 5, from verse 4, it says, Behold, the hire of the laborers who have ripped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, cries. You see, the, you see the thing there, that uh, they will hire people. And as they hire people, employed people, those people will sweat. Those people will spend their time, spend everything they have. They forsake their families in trying to work for this individual. And then at the end of the day, end of the week, end of the month, they will not pay them. That's why James descended on them with the word of God. He said they hire. That means the wages of the laborers, the employees that have ripped down your fields, that have worked for you, which also of you kept back by fraud, by deceit. Uh, you, you will be telling them lies. Uh, you, you know the condition of things now. Uh, I will pay you later. Uh, just keep on working. Three months you have not paid them. Six months you have not paid them. It's like the cries of them which have reaped, uh, which have reaped, are uh, entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. The word Sabaoth there is uh, the word host. It means the Lord of the hosts of angels, of myriads of angels in heaven. That Lord who is sovereign in authority. Over the hosts of angels, he has heard the cries of the people that are crying. The children that cannot go to school. Their wives that are dying of hunger. Or that are now having ulcer, terrible ulcer. Because it's not because the man in the house is not working. But because the you that you pay them, you are not paying them. It says that the man is crying and the wife is crying and his children are crying. The cries are entering into the ears of the Lord of hosts. It says in verse 5, ye have lived in pleasure. The people working for you, they are living in rags. They are living, they are suffering. And they are regretting that they are working with you. And when they want to leave you to go and work in another place, you call them, what's the matter? Are you not a Christian? Of course I will pay you. It's because of the conditions now. You brainwash them again and they still stay. And they are staying in suffering. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. And then it says, ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. That is, you are being fed, even overfed, as Perceive that you are a chicken or hen or whatever it is uh, of a Greek, that they are feeding and feeding and becoming fat so that eventually it is for slaughter. It says you have condemned and killed the jaws. You have even gone to the point that you condemn them. You find a way of saying something and doing something and rope them in something so that you deny them of their right. And the man, he doesn't have money to eat. How can he have money to take lawyer? And they come against him and say you are cheating him. And he does not receive Ceased you. That's the damnation, the condemnation of these uh, people. And as I told you, the condemnation is all over the Bible. And if, uh, if we are like that, maybe you are saying, well, thank God I'm not like that. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. I'm a child of God. The question is, are you paying, your are you paying, paying the people you employed? 
And even if you didn't employ them, and uh, you are the person to pay, you have been given that right as your office and the place of work, are you paying them the right thing? Or do they have to bribe you and give you a percentage before they receive what is their due? Before they receive what really actually belongs to them? In Malachi chapter 3 verse 5. Malachi chapter 3 verse 5 it says and I will come near to you to judgment I will be a sweet witness against the sorcerer and against the adulterers and against the false wearers and against those that oppress the hireling in their wages oppress the hireling in their wages there are many ways you can oppress a, an employee a hireling in their wages you may give them something that is much 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 below their certificate you know that this man is a great Graduate. He has come to work with you, and you know that he's been looking for a job a long time, and you are trying to build up a particular organization, a particular company, and uh, you want to make it in good time. Therefore, you know what they ought to receive, but you will not give them what they ought to receive. You oppress the hireling, you oppress the employee in his wages, and the widow, and the fatherless, that turn aside the stranger from his right, and uh, fear me not, says the Lord of course, he says, if we're doing that, you may profess I'm born again. You may profess I'm sanctified. You may profess I'm a child of God. You do not know the Lord. If you're oppressing the people that are working with you, you are cheating them. In Gen Jeremiah chapter 22. Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 13. Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness. Take note of that. Uh, I want to build a house. Um, I want to get land. I want to get this. Therefore, you are not considering other people. Uh, it's good you build a house. There's nothing wrong in that. It's good you get land. There is nothing wrong in that. It's good you live conveniently. There's nothing wrong in that. But if you do it to oppress other people, to cheat other people, to destroy other people, that's when it is wrong. Warn to him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by wrong that uses his neighbor's service without wages. Be thinking about yourself now. If you're using the service of other people and there are no wages and giveth him not for his work. Giveth him not. You don't give them what is appropriate for the work they are doing. That saith, I will build me a wide house and large chambers and, uh, and uh, cutteth uh, him out windows and it is sealed with seed and painted with vermilion and shall thou reign because thou closest thyself in cedar did not thy father eat and drink and do justice and judgment and justice and then it was well with him he judged the cause of the poor and the needy and then it was well with him was not this to know me says the Lord but thine eyes and thine heart and not but for thy covetousness and for to shed innocent blood and oppression and violence and to do it. And this is telling us the condemnation of the judgment that rests upon the people that can cheat other people, oppress other people, and they will not bat an eye. They don't have any feeling for the suffering of other people. In Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 27. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore, they have become great and waxing rich. You see them, they are becoming rich. Uh, they may tell you, oh, it's the prosperity of the Lord, it's a blessing of... No, it's not the blessing of the Lord. Many of the people that are going to some of these churches and they are talking about prosperity, prosperity, they do a lot of things to cheat other people, to oppress other people so that they can be rich. And eventually, if they have a little bit of the riches of this world, they will say, it's, it's because we're living by faith. No, you're living by fraud. You're living by oppressing other people. That's not how God blesses people. If you are going to be blessed of God indeed, you will do the right thing for the people that are walking with you. It says, as a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore, they have become great and waxing rich. It says, they are waxing fat, they shine, yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. They even go beyond the wicked people. They judge not because the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper. And the right of the needy they have not, uh, uh, they, they judge not. Shall I not visit for these things, says the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? It's telling us that even if the whole nation is doing it, judgment will still come. You know why some people are practicing
doing this bad evil things. They say, I'm not the only one. Everybody is doing it. And if everybody is doing it, is God going to bring judgment upon everybody? Oh, yes. If the whole nation is doing bad, bad things, the Lord will bring judgment upon everybody. Therefore, if you really want to have the blessing of the Lord, you will separate yourself from uh, those uh, evil practices. Sephaniah chapter 1. Sephaniah chapter 1 verse 18. It says, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. It's talking about these people that will be condemned, that will be damned, that the judgment of God will come upon. Their silver, their gold will not be able to de deliver them in the day of judgment. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy readance of all them that dwell in the land. He will get rid of the people that are doing evil. As we have studied all these things tonight, you want to think about yourself. You want to think about the work you are doing. You want, how are you getting your own riches? How are you getting what uh, you say you have? Are you getting it in good ways? Or are you getting it in fraudulent manners? Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ himself told us in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, he said, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world if it were possible for you to get all the money in this whole state all the money in this uh, whole nation even if it were possible for you to gain the whole world if you lose your soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul and then jesus christ told us the story of a man he was rich rich in material things rich in earthly things but he was not rich in uh, in faith rich in money see he was not reaching love he was not reaching doing good to other people in luke chapter 16 reading from verse 19 here is a story not a parable because in a parable you don't give the name of a person in a parable when you give the name of a person you are telling a story he told this story in luke chapter 16 verse 19 there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and feared sumptuously every day and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of souls, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his souls, and uh, it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by, carried by who? by the angels into Abraham's bosom. If you are a child of God, I don't mind whatever may be happening in the world now. If you die, the angels will carry you to Abraham's bosom. And if you don't die and Jesus Christ comes, uh, comes back in the rapture, he will take us with him in Jesus' name. And eventually in that verse 22, the rich man also died. They think they'll never die. They think they'll be there forever. They think that they're going to enjoy all the riches forever. And they think that the thing is there for them to spend. And they'll be spending almost for eternity and they will not do good with the money that they have but eventually the rich man also died and he was buried and in hell he lift up his eyes being in torment and seeth Abraham afar off, afar off he was not able to get there and uh, I pray for you, you will, this will not be your Lord in Jesus name and then he saw Abraham he saw Lazarus in his bosom and he cried, didn't James tell us they will cry, they will cry they will weep, they will mourn and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. He was tormented in that flame. That was hellfire. And once he got there, there is no way he will ever come out again. My prayers that we will never get there in Jesus' name. And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which will pass from hence unto you cannot, neither and they pass to us that will come from thence. He said, where you are now, that is fixed, that is final. There is no way you can leave that place and come over here. And there is no way anybody can leave here and come to the other side. Therefore, you are there, you are there forever. We still have the chance. This is the time we can pray to the Lord. This is the time we can repent of any wickedness in our hand, any oppression in our hand. If we are afflicting other people, cheating other people, if we are fraudulent, this is the time we can 
can make amends and we can make restitutions now. We can go back to our places of work and go back to our neighbors and tell those poor people, I'm sorry, I offended you, I cheated you. You calculate everything that you got away from them unlawfully and you give unto them. Then you tell them to forgive you, you tell the Lord to forgive you and then your name will be in the book of life and if you close your eyes on earth here, you'll open your eyes and the presence of the Lord Almighty. I pray that will be your Lord in Jesus' name. Why don't you rise up and say, Lord, in this single life that I have to live, you will help me. I will not oppress the poor. I will not cheat the poor. I will not give bribe. I will not steal. I will not be fraudulent. I will think about other people. I will think about my employees. I will think of the people that are working with me and working for me. I will think of their good. I will think of their convenience. I will think of their prosperity. I will not be selfishly thinking about my prosperity alone, about my convenience alone, about my possession alone. I will think about their children. I will think about their wives. I will think about their husband. I will think about their relatives that depend upon them. And I will not allow their wages to stick to my hand so I can enrich myself. Make me kind. Make me loving. Make me considerate. Make me just so that I will do the right thing towards the people that are working with me and working for me. And if you are the one paying people in your place of work, you will not take any percentage. You will not cheat anybody. They have worked for that money. You give everything to them whole. Let us pray that God will give us the grace. We'll behave the way we ought to behave. We'll be just and kind and loving to people. And then when the trumpet shall sound, because we are saved and because we have the holiness of God in us, we shall be there on that final day. Pray that the Lord will help you. He will help you so that on the final day, you'll get to heaven, you will not go to hell.